Hey everyone, Dr. Tim and Hillary for another Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast. How you doing today, Hillary? I am doing great. Just got back from Riva Palooza, Orlando. Yes, nice show. Seeing everybody. So it's it was a lot cool. of fun. Yep. Yes, we saw lots of people, talked to lots of people. It was a good crowd. Have a month or so to recover and then on to the tri-states, New Jersey, New York. Um, I should have the dates for those, but I don't. Uh, June, I think it's like the 24th and 25th of June, maybe. Don't quote me. Uh, it is the 25th and 26th of June. I was close. And um, the... Uh, Meadow, it's at the Secaucus Meadowland Conference Center, where it's been the last couple of years. So, yeah, come on out, folks. It's a good weekend. It's a uh, lots of good. Uh, it's a good time to see you know corals and manufacturers talk some reef, and uh, we even had freshwater tank and a reptile tank. So. Yes, I'm so excited. I was actually talking to. Peter Sherrick from Reef News Network, which I know you've been on his podcast before. Um, and he's like, what? You guys do reptile stuff now? I was like, yeah, we sure do. So. Yes. And the new pumps and things are being made. Oh, I'm so excited. We'll talk about those more folks once they get on the water from Italy. Made yep. in Italy at the factory, not private labeled. It's our stuff there. It's going to be great. We'll have that later on this summer. So we're just giving you a teaser right now. Yep. And, and to, they've probably seen it because we've posted and aficionado channel, Richard Back has uh, tagged us in that and did like a recap from global. So that is out in the world. People know it's coming. So yep. we'll have so more detailed information. If this is the first you've heard about it, well, you can go back to there, to Richard's channel or from our links or however that's done. And uh, he's got some video we talk about. It's going to be, we're, we're really excited about it. Oh, yeah, definitely. I can't wait. I'm so excited for the salt. So um, today, though, the topic yes. at hand is microorganisms or microbiology 101. We're just yes. going to do some basics because after speaking to a lot of people at Reefo Palooza and looking at the mailbox, um, you know, pe people are confused about bacteria, what they can do, what they can't do. There's lots of terminology, so it's like a different language. And there's, unfortunately, due to the fact that there are many people in this hobby, that think they know microbiology and don't, there's lots of incorrect. I won't even say miss. I'll just say it's incorrect. It's just wrong. So we're going to try to clear that up a little bit today in uh, the first session. We're not aware of uh, microbiology 101. <laughs> yes. I like it. it. You know, it's been a long time, at least for me, since I've gone through biology classes. So it's always good to have a refresher. Yep. And there's lots of new information. That's, that's the cool thing about science. It's uh, with new experiments, new data, new ideas. People try out, you know, a new hypothesis. You've heard that. Everybody's heard that. Um, you learn new information. Even, you know, my, my first oh geez, year, year and a half in graduate school was a big giant negative. In, you know, in terms of I developed those molecular probes based on RNA to detect uh, you know, Nitrosomonas europea and Nitrobacter minogratsky in aquarium samples because that's what the books and the experts said. And I could never find them. And that was a finding right there. It's like, well, after you dig deep enough and you don't find anything, maybe you want to see what else is there or what's there or change what you're doing, which is what I did. And we've talked about that. So that's the neat thing about science is that it's always uh, evolving, pun intended, I guess. So. All right. So shall we jump in, Hillary? All right. Let's get started. I'm going to keep this one real basic. What are bacteria? 
Well, I'm going to make it a little bit more generalized because you know, a couple hundred years ago, that question wouldn't even have been asked because people didn't really know much about bacteria, maybe a little longer. But even maybe 40, 50 years ago, it would have been what are bacteria. I prefer what are microorganisms. And the reason being is that there are, Bacteria are a specific kingdom of organisms, and we now know there's another do domain, do specific domain of organisms, and we now know there's another domain called archaea. And on the surface, maybe they look like, I use that very general, look like bacteria, but when you get down into their DNA, they're as different to bacteria as bacteria are to humans. So they're the third domain of life. And why do I bring that up? Well, it turns out that a lot of the work done on discovering archaea has been done in aquariums, which is really cool. And so it used to be you, you know, had ammonia oxidizing bacteria. Well, there's ammonia oxidizing archaea. And why that's important to distinguish between the two is because of how you grow them. Now we're, we're getting out of bacteria 101 a little bit, but so let's, let's come back. So basically we're gonna talk about what are these microorganisms that grow in aquariums and how are they different? And the big thing to understand is they're not human, which sounds crazy. Yeah, of course they're microorganisms. But we humans tend to give human traits to everything. And as we go on, you will understand why that is important to understand. It's why it's important to understand that giving these human traits to these microorganisms leads to lots of falsehoods that you read about and that people talk about in, in the aquarium business. So basically... The microorganisms are just like it's not generally organisms you can't see with the naked eye. That's why you need a microscope. And when you start zeroing in or magnifying your water surfaces, there are microorganisms every place. They're everywhere in your aquarium. They're everywhere on you, in you. And you've started hearing maybe about the, you know, but uh, the gut biome and, and biogenomics and stuff like that. Because even when I first started school, microbiology was basically trying to grow these or organisms on a Petri dish in some type of uh, auger or some type of culture medium. And talk about boring. And struggling because you, you would spend weeks, months trying to do this and fail. So it wasn't all that exciting. Skip ahead. Now we have modern techniques based on RNA and DNA. and We can sequence organisms quickly. We don't have to culture things. We can just take a sample and in relatively inexpensive and quickly, you can get an idea of what's there. So just... Um, instead of having to grow anything, it's just what's there. And that leads to all sorts of uh, being able to answer all sorts of questions, like who are the nitrifiers? So these organisms you can't really see. You need some dedicated equipment um, to, if you want to identify them and see them. Um, but they're critical to everything that we do. And the unintended consequence of most of what we do as aquarist pushes the system to favor one group of microorganisms over another, usually to consequences that we don't like, or we end up killing all the microorganisms and the system basically becomes ripe to be taken over by algae, or when we push it out of balance, cyanobacteria, or in terrible cases, dinoflagellates, which are protist. So all the stuff we do has a consequence. And that's part of um, getting into this microbiology 101 
is to understand what these consequences are. So let's then start at the beginning. So in general, there are two types of microorganisms. And remember, I mean general here. And we classify them, you know, microbiologists, like all scientists, love to classify things. So one way we classify things is how they get their energy. Do they get their energy by breaking a chemical bond? Or do they get their energy by basically consuming, and I use that in a general term, but by, by consuming organics. And that's the difference between what's called a chemotroph and an organotroph. And so we heard of nitrifying bacteria, nitrifying archaea, I just mentioned these. Nitrifying microorganisms are chemotrophs. They get their energy by converting ammonia to nitrite or nitrite to nitrate. That versus these organotrophs, which is basically most everything else, sludge busters, you know, why are we not covered in sludge? Why is your aquarium not just full to the rim with sludge? Um, or out here, out in the wild, you know, you have leaves and trees and all this organic material, what's, what, what's happening? Well, it's all being recycled. And it's all being recycled by the activities of microorganisms. At the, at the end, you have, you know, animals that break this stuff down, fungi that break it down, and then the microorganisms, basically what's called remineralize it. They take the final step and put and turn this material into basic chemical components. And that's what's happening in your aquarium. So we need both though. We need the nitrifiers, obviously, and we need the organic reducers. Then there's also classification of microorganisms on how they get their carbon source. All organisms need carbon. How they get it and the source of carbon is another classification. So autotrophs get their carbon from carbon dioxide, where heterotrophs get their carbon from breaking down organics. And because a lot of the early microbiology was done in you know, Germany, this is you know, a long time ago, and, and in the German language, you take single words and you just smash them together to make really, really long words. So that's why you'll read that nitrifying bacteria are chemoautotrophs. So they're chemo, they're, they get their energy from a chemical, breaking a chemical bond, and they're auto, which means they get their carbon from carbon dioxide, where heterotrophs are organ, you know, technically organic, organoheterotrophs. So they're getting their energy from organics, and they're breaking down organics, which makes them heterotrophs. So two different bacteria, and when, why is two different groups of bacteria? Why is this important? Because they both compete for space and resources. And the heterotrophic bacteria that break down organics, they can double in every 20, every 20 or 30 minutes. That's why sometimes your tank will go really cloudy. If you have a lot of organics in there, you overdosed fuel, you know, some type of a, of, of a sugar, which is an organic, and you add it at the same time, some bacteria, you're basically throwing lighter fluid on the barbecue and you've got this, um, you know, a, a bacteria breakout or, or um, uh, oh, just went blank on what we call that, Hillary. A bloom. Blooms. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we were just talking about cyanobacteria blooms off San Diego. Anyway, um, yes. You, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, you've got a bacterial bloom. Nitrifying bacteria cannot bloom. They they divide because the yield of energy is so small that they double every twenty to thirty hours, not minutes like heterotrophs. Hours. 
So nitrifiers are very slow growing, whether they're bacteria or archaea, it doesn't matter. They're very slow growing. And that is why you hear when I talk about how to cycle your tank, you want to not add anything that promotes the growth of heterotrophs because the heterotrophs will take over that surface or grow right over the nitrifiers. And both organisms need a small amount of phosphate and some micronutrients to grow. And usually when you set up your tank, most of those micronutrients are in very small supply. Even phosphate is in short supply. And if you have the heterotrophs growing, they're going to basically take all those micronutrients, slowing the growth of your nitrifiers. So just this one fact of that heterotrophs grow so much faster than nitrifiers tells you when you first set up your aquarium, don't be adding any uh, organic substances, uh, vitamins, all these things that can promote heterotrophic growth. Don't add bio pellets because that's organic to try to grow heterotrophs. Don't be putting phosphate removing media into the system because you don't want to limit phosphate in the very beginning. So good start so far, Hillary. I think so. Although you've hit a lot of my questions, so we may have to go over some of these again. Just that's okay. Make sure we it's, them. Yeah, it's I know I rambled there for a few minutes. So um but well, I wanna... it's so easy with all of this. So much of it is tied together, you know, at like, oh, well, you know, we always talk about going off on tangents, but it, like, it's really easy to. Right. And, and, and there, you know, there is a, a environment here with your aquarium and what you're doing is affecting things. And when, you know, they used to have the, the lead in school, the balanced of, of aquarium, freshwater aquarium. And what it is, in all these systems, when you, we say balance, you don't want to struggle with algae and green water and smells and stuff like that. So basically, you have to have something that consumes all this waste, be it bacteria, plants, you know, some type of mechanical filter filtration system that can consume all the waste at equal at the rate that you add it. And when, when things get out of balance, it's when generally the aquarist is adding too much food and the system can't handle it and the system gets polluted. And then you start growing organisms that live in polluted environments. And polluted doesn't just mean, you know, stinky, dirty water. Pollution in this case can be excess nitrates and phosphates because we have this glass box full of water you have lots of phosphates and nitrates, and now you put a nice you know, LED or all these nice lamps that are available on it. Lamps put out light, which is energy for all sorts of microorganisms and, and algae. And that's why you get the algae and cyanobacteria and dinoflagellates, which are photosynthetic. So everything is linked here. And understanding how they're linked is key to basically enjoying your aquarium with a minimum amount of frustration. So when you first start up and you have the nitrifiers, you know, well, people say, you know, obviously a disclaimer or, you know, full, full disclosure, we grow nitrifiers and we sell them and they're in a bottle. And you can't believe how many times we get the comment, well, nitrifiers can't live in a bottle. Bacteria can't live in a bottle. And the question, well, why can't they live in a bottle? And invariably we get, well, they can't breathe because they're stuck in a bottle. Well, human can't breathe stuck in a bottle eventually, but bacteria don't breathe. They don't have lungs. They don't respire like we do, like humans with you know, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out and stuff like that because they don't have the lungs. What the only time bacteria, microorganisms, nitrifiers, heterotrophs need oxygen is when they are actually converting 
their subs the, the, the sort the substrate that they want to use, whether it's ammonia, nitrite, or organics. When they're converting that to ammonia to nitrite, nitrite to nitrate, if you were to look at the chemical equation, you'd see there's an there's an oxygen molecule there. That's the only time they need oxygen. So if they're in the bottle, they're not being they're not converting anything because any decent manufacturer would know don't put ammonia or nitrite in the bottle. Uh, you don't need to feed the bacteria in the bottle. And so they don't need oxygen, so they don't breathe, and they survive quite well. But where did this myth come of bacteria can't live in a bottle? Well, it came because reputable manufacturers using the best science at the time thought that it was certain species of nitrifiers. Unreputable manufacturers didn't put anything in the bottle. And as you, the consumer, starts using this, and you've got people that have had fish stores for a long time, and there was a lot of failure. They would sell people a bottled mixture of bacteria, and it wouldn't accelerate anything. What should a bottled mixture of bacteria do? It should shorten the nitrify, you know, getting your biofilter going, which usually takes, you know, 35 to 42 days. And if you add a bacteria culture from a bottle, that should be drastic, you know, drastically shortened. And in most cases, it didn't. And I think I told you this, Hillary, when I was, you know, like 10 years old, I wrote to a leading manufacturer that time asking for my money back because I'd used their mix and it didn't do a thing. And I got my money back. <laughs> there you go. Um, but uh, so, so it should shorten the cycle and it, and it didn't be, why? Because they were using the wrong bacteria or some companies not using any bacteria at all. Um, so this myth got started. Bacteria can work in a bottle. They have to be the right bacteria. Doesn't mean they work every time in every case, as we've talked about some of these things. Um, it's more applied. You can look at past podcasts or some videos that we've done about what you need to do to have a successful cycling, but you need to basically start out with the right organisms. Yes. Now I've got a question. We're talking about how they don't need, um, like they can live in the bottle. And you said that like, you don't have to give a food source. They don't need a food source. Correct. Because micro, uh, microorganisms differ from humans in many ways, but one is they are patient, especially when it become, comes to their food source. They, they can shut down their cell and go into whatever you want to call it, resting phase, suspended animation. They, you know, a lot of the heterotrophs can form spores where they basically surround themselves and hibernate until conditions get better. So they don't work on this scale of, I need a meal a day or three meals a day, or I have to eat at least every few days. They, they work, I mean, it, if in, when we grow the heterotrophic bacteria that make up waste away and clear up and others, we can make them in a powdered form where the, in that powder, they can basically last indefinitely. Okay, now I've got a question. So, so they're kind of like sea monkeys in that sense that like they can survive indefinitely in those cysts or those eggs until you add water to them and they're like, oh, okay, conditions are right. It's, it's cool for me to come to life. Right, exactly. Yep. And that's also when we, we I was talking to a couple people um, at, at RAP and they're talking about, well, they're, uh, this one guy had sent off this genome, you know, sample off to a genomic company of a tank. He had two tanks. One had a, a UV sterilizer on it all the time, was running all the time. The other didn't. And he got the data back and he said it was, was kind of amazing. The tank with the UV had microorganisms in the water, but it had very little diverse I mean basically one microorganism was making up more than 80 percent of all the organisms in the water where the one without had a lot more types of, of microorganisms in the water and what that 
tells you and then what people have to understand about UV, and this is one of these unintended consequences, because people will, will say, well, I want to put a UV on, it's going to kill the micro, all the microorganisms in the water, it's going to make my water healthier for my fish or corals. And the answer is no, nah, not necessarily, because different types of microorganisms need in, uh, and to kill them, you need different, um, a different amount of UV. And we won't get too technical in that. Just basically understand UV as used in aquariums does not kill 100% or even 99, 98% of the microorganisms in the water. What it does is it kills a lot of different organisms, but it allows the organisms it can't kill to dominate the system. And that may or may not be a good thing for your system. So none of the technologies that we use in our aquariums kill 100% of anything. What they do is they unintentionally, and I say that because I don't think most people realize this and they're not doing it on purpose, but it unintentionally pushes the system to favor one or two or a group of microorganisms that you may or may not want. And that's the same by running a skimmer because you're favoring, uh, you're removing certain organisms that live in the water, but a skimmer doesn't do anything to organisms that live on the surface. And that brings up another type of, of uh, difference between microorganisms. I mean, every, everybody's probably seen the pictures. They talk about it all the time. And you have these nice pictures of lo what look like a stack of hot dogs. Does that make sense, Hillary? You know, that's what everybody kind of shows is these uh, rods of bacteria and they're stacked on top of each other, kind of haphazard, you know, like, like logs or something like that. And, or they're in the water and things, but microorganisms have preferences just like um, every, you know, all or animals and organisms do. Um, where they, some prefer to live in the water and do one function, where others prefer to live on surfaces or in biofilms, which basically these microorganisms can live in a community and extrude a substance that protects them. And how's that relate to aquariums? Well, it's why more one reason more, more municipalities use chloramine is because the protective um, cocoon these organisms live in, they coat the pipe, they, cope, they coat your piping, your return tubes, all that PVC pipe, that slime that you feel in the sump and in the tank is basically all microorganisms living inside of this secreted um, cocoon. And it makes it harder to treat them if you're trying to treat them for a disease or uh, chlorinate them or something like that. And that brings up another basic point, microbiology 101, is it actually pretty hard to kill most of these microorganisms. People tend to think, well, a little bit of chlorine and everything's dead. Chlorine, again, kills some microorganisms quite easily other microorganisms, not so easily. So it's a selective force. And in most cases, to kill a microorganism, you need to either damage its UV, which is generally what, or damage its DNA, which is what UV does, or you need to break open the cell. Now, in the lab, when we want to get, get to, you know, we, we want to do a DNA sample so we can do the genomics and things like that, we have to break open the cell because inside the cell is the DNA. To do this, we use a, a basically a soap at a very high temperature. And in some cases, we might put these little micro beads in there and shake it up to, to really basically rip the cell walls open. It's not the easiest thing in the world to get to most bacteria. 
And that's why when you're washing your hands, basically you're washing the bacteria off your hands. Whether you kill them or not, that's a different thing. It is generally quite hard to kill most microorganisms. All right. <laughs> okay. Am, am I... Am I just destroying everyone's myths here, Hillary? Just checking them off one at a time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you can't kill them. They took over the world. They do what they want. Because that okay, they do what they want. Because that's that's another point, microbiology 101. Some organisms, you know, these microorganisms, ammonia oxidizers pretty much convert ammonia. Nitrite or, organisms convert nitrite. And they need to have oxygen just because the biochemical reactant, what's happening inside the cell requires oxygen. You can't what's called oxidize ammonia without the presence of oxygen. But heterotrophic bacteria, the ones like in our sludge busters or these organic ones I talked about, they can live life very, very differently depending upon conditions. And this is what one, if, if from this podcast, you, you understand one thing, this is the important part. Heterotrophic bacteria, most of them, not all, but many, they can live if there's oxygen in the water, or that's called a, you know, aerobic. They can live when there's low amounts of oxygen in the water, condition called anaerobic. They can also live when there's absolutely no oxygen in the water, and that's called anoxic. And what I mean by living is basically the only thing a microorganism wants to do is become two. It wants to just divide. I mean, that, that's what it's genetically programmed to do, consume nutrients and divide. And then those two cells consume nutrients and divide and become four. You know, that's just what it's here for is now for us, it can degrade or it can do good things, degrade organics, consume ammonia, get rid of nitrite, you know, things like that. But getting back to these heterotrophs, there's all sorts of fancy names, you know, anaerobic, faculty anaerobic, obligate aerobes. Don't worry about that. And what you have to understand is that most cells, microorganism cells, can survive under a wide variety of conditions. So let me give you an example, because I like to do that so you can understand and how to apply this. You've got a canister filter. It's sealed, right? Got it. However it is, there's an inlet, the tube comes in. And there's a pump and the water goes out. So we're bringing, what's that bringing? It's bringing water. It's bringing organics. It's trapping the organics against some type of a mechanical filter, whether it's a sieve or beads or filter floss or whatever. And the microorganisms start to work. These organic bacteria break down the organics. That's what they do. There's plenty of oxygen. So they're doing this aerobically converting organics and they break the organic material into ammonia. That's why we even put on our waste away. You, you add a little waste away to the tank and your ammonia may temporarily increase because these bacteria are technically, it's called mineralizing, but they're breaking or degrading this organic material down into more basic compounds and eventually chemicals. And one of the basic ones is ammonia. So that's fine. You've got a nitrifying colony and your bacteria somewhere in the tank and they're taking care of the ammonia. So you never really see this. But if you've listened to many of my talks, you'll say that I'm not a huge fan of using canister filters for nitrification because what's going to happen? As that can't, mechanical filter becomes clogged up with organics and the Nit the organic bacteria are doing the best they can, breaking things down. The flow is getting less and less through the system, which means the water going through the canister filter is less and less, which means there's less oxygen coming. 
And so at the top where the water enters, there's oxygen and you've got the organic bacteria, these heterotrophic bacteria, and they're operating aerobically and they're breaking the uh, organic material down into ammonia. As the water goes down a little deeper, it's got less oxygen because the bacteria at the top are consuming it. So now you're in anaerobic, low oxygen phase. Well, these same cells now can take the organics and combine it with any nitrate in the water and do denitrification where they're producing N2 nitrogen gas, which is nice. You know, it reduces the nitrate in your system. And that, that's cool. And that's what a lot of these systems do when they talk about, you know, put a stack of media here and have the water go through it. What they're doing is trying to cultivate or you know, heterotrophic bacteria on the outside and, and the same cells, heterotrophic bacteria on the inside that see less oxygen. And once you get into the anaerobic zone, these bacteria will take the nitrate out of the water. But here's where things get a little sticky. These same cells, as that water flow lessens, so less oxygen goes through the media the media zone will eventually become anoxic or you've got a power outage and there's no water in the system at all. There's still lots of organics. There's still those organisms, but now they have no oxygen coming in contact with them because the canister's off. There's a power outage, something like that. Once it goes anoxic, they start producing hydrogen sulfide. And that is why when you pop that lid off or you, you know, the electricity comes back on and you get great, you know, let me get the canister flowing back into the tank and you get that huge whiff of hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg smell. That's what ha that's what's happening. And I think Hillary, we did a podcast on how to prepare for storms and earthquakes and ice storms. Maybe yes, a year. we did. Yeah. I think it was last summer, almost around this time last year. Yeah, and, and, and one of the main things I said was clean your canister filters because when the power goes out, these bacteria don't just go, oh, no power, I'll stop, I'll wait till it gets back on. No, the very same cell goes, oh, I don't have oxygen, no problem. I'll, I'll get some nitrate because the water has nitrate. I got a little oxygen. Oh, I got no oxygen. I'll take the sulfate. And if you're talking a seawater system, there's plenty of sulfate there and the cell goes fine. I'll, I'll take sulfate and I'll basically reduce it to hydrogen sulfide. Same cell. It's the, it, so, and, and I'm generalizing here, but this is what's happening in the system. And that's why I always say if, if your power has been out, if your filter has been off, do not just turn it back on. Just take it off the system, go over to the sink and rinse it out carefully. Don't worry about the nitrifying bacteria. At this point, you want to get oxygen back in the system. You want to get rid of all these organics and get these cells back working to in, a, in an aerobic environment. But a lot of people talk about, well, you need these specialized cells to do this. You need the specialized cells to do that. As with most of the wives' tale in this industry, you do if you're trying to do certain things, but in most cases, you don't. It's the same cell, and they can do this depending, you know, in, in as little as a couple hours, even less if there's tons of inorganic or organics in the sealed system. Once the oxygen starts lowering, they just change what they're doing. Once it disappears, they change again. So you have to be aware of that. It's pretty intense. <laughs> I, like, as you're explaining all this, I was like, I, I'm a big fan of the Iron Man movies. I'm like, it's kind of like Tony Stark. Any situation that they've dropped him in, like he's figured out how to handle it and manipulate his environment to make something that allows him to adapt and survive. Right. And, and that's why I hate the word primitive. Well, primitive cells, you know, they're, they're really, you've got a microorganism that can live in oxygen, with a little bit of oxygen, no oxygen. Well, what about us, you know, geniuses here, humans? <laughs> <laughs> what, 
we can't do that. No, no oxygen. We're pretty much dead. We want to go scuba diving. Put a put a you know bottle of air on your back, and you got what an hour or two, depending if you've got a double pack or a aluminum eighty or whatever. But we don't have an infinite amount of time here. Bacteria are like fine. We got all day. We got all night. It doesn't matter to us. So who's probably war and peace while you guys figure it out? Yeah, you know, and don't have any food. No problem. I'll I'll chill for a while. You know. That's not, <laughs> when you start thinking about it, and I am being a little anthropomorphic here, but when you do think about it, who's the primitive cell or organism in this discussion? I'm thinking maybe us. It does give you a lot more respect for them, like learning how much they can do. And it's pretty cool. Right. And getting you know, to, so, so we've talked about, you know, the, the, the cells, they're very flexible. That's one thing you have to understand. The microorganisms are very flexible. There are microorganisms that will take care of anything. There are even microorganisms that live and convert radioactive substances. Now, they don't do it fast. There's microorganisms that can live in a pH below one, in a pH basically above 14, there are microorganisms everywhere doing something. And they are, and I'll wrap, I'll wrap this up a little bit and we'll have to go to class again here. Sorry, I've been yakking. Um, but there are microorganisms in the water and on surfaces. And when we manipulate, as I've said, in this last 45 minutes, when we manipulate and say, oh, I want no phosphate. I talk about this a lot. People come up to me at the show and they say, I'm, I've been battling dinoflagellates for a year. And I just think, why a year? You know, it just, you, you, and, and I'll just say your, nit your nitrates are zero and your phosphates are zero. And they'll say, yeah, that's great, right? It's like, nope, that's the problem. And so you have to understand what's going on in your aquarium and the unintended consequence of what I've said, chasing numbers or trying to keep the water too clean, having the lights on too long. Um, your system is going to grow some type of microorganism. And the key to enjoying all this is knowing what water chemistry values you need so that you're right in the sweet spot where you're not growing dinoflagellates, you're not growing cyanobacteria, you're not growing green algae. And we're going to answer that in the next podcast, right? We're going to go to commercial and leave everybody hanging, right? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that to you. Yes. Sorry. Um, so, you you want and, and I'm sk I'm skipping out of microbiology 101 to a bit of applied microbiology. If you're having issues with green algae, cyanobacteria, dinoflagellates, can't grow corals, everything looks terrible. I can pretty much, you know, I hate to say guarantee, but I'm pretty I'm, I'm pretty solid footing here that your phosphate is need is not where it needs to be which is generally about 0.05 to 0.1 you do not want it zero that will give you dinoflagellates your nitrate should be around 5 to 10 ppm nitrate those that's really doesn't mean you're not going to have any problems but Usually, if, if you're having issues, if you have dinoflagellates, if you have cyanobacteria, buying our products, going out, spending tons of money, doing all these things, buying all this stuff is not going to help unless you have your nutrient levels in the right zone. And zero, zero is not the zone. So... I, I've said this several times last week at Reefal Palooza to people is you need to get your nitrates and phosphates in the right zone. Then you can start solving the problem. And, and 
buying you know waste away to help or refresh to help or things like that but until you've got an environment that is right for the bacteria that are in the water and on surfaces you're just going to be pulling out your head and there's more than just the water chemistry i talked i said unintended consequences many times you know, right now I, I saw there are several companies out there, Hillary, I don't know if you saw that are doing the roller filters now. I've seen some of those, yeah. You know, and so you so basically, if you don't know what it is, it it's kind of picture a roll of paper on one end, and then uh, it stretches through the water and collects on a roll on the other end, and the idea is that the water goes through this paper filter material and it strips out the organics. The, the problem with all these mechanical, all, all these devices, no, that's mechanical, UV, protein skimmer, roller filters, all these different things is that by changing the organic level and by removing bacteria from the water column, you're generally making the system more conducive to organisms that live on surfaces. You're not going to outrun the microorganisms. You're, you know, you're not going to outsmart them. You're going to push the system to favor algae with too high nutrients, cyanobacteria when you have basically no nitrate, or dinoflagellates when you have no phosphate and no nitrate, that system favors dinos. You can't overcome nature. Um, so the idea is to have a good balance. And I've, as I said many times, put the skimmer on a timer, put the UV on a timer. You don't need to be running all these devices 24-7. Nope. In fact, I just answered a question about uh, having a, how long do I need to have my skimmer on this morning. So. Right. So I know we had some questions beforehand, Hillary went through this. Have I covered them all? I think so. Yeah. I, I Do I have time to add like two more questions? Oh, sure. Yeah. So one, well, I guess, I guess it could be a two part. So what are the correct kind of bacteria and how to know what you already have? So that if you want to correct, if you've got an imbalance, how do you go about it? Like, oh, I need to add this product because I don't have enough of these to correct things. Well, the the answer to that is we don't know. And, and I'm not being um, flippant, but but obviously we need nitrifiers, in, but, but how many and how, for how long and they start growing, people say, why do I keep on adding? Because we just, we just, we disturb the environment. We clean things. We clean the glass. We clean the rock. We siphon clean, which means don't clean, but you're also stripping out the bacteria. But um, the, tr the scientific answer is the community of nitrifying bacteria changes with the members of that. There's back ammonia oxidizing bacteria. There's the ammonia oxidizing archaea, the percentage of ammonia oxidizers versus nitride oxidizers. And we don't have a good idea on what you, you know, how many you need or, or how, how often, other than the fact you can measure ammonia and nitrite easy. I mean, that, that's compared to a doing organics. Okay. So you can get your, your test kits. If you can measure ammonia nitrite in your system, there's one of two things wrong. One is that your water, your water chemistry is no good, meaning your pH is super low. They don't like pH, low pH. Your um, water is very soft. There's something basically wrong with the water or you're overfeeding and overcrowding them. You're doing something where they just don't have the water flow or the surface to grow on. Or secondly, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, well, secondly, is you don't have the substrate. I mean, maybe you have good water quality, but you've got a bare bottom tank. Nitrifiers don't grow well on just flat glass surfaces. They need substrate. They don't really work well 
as single-celled organisms floating around in the water. They need substrate. They need a, they need a home, a place to colonize. But it's easy. To, it, so, and, and with our mixes, you know, we did a lot of research, obviously been doing this for years and years and years. Yes, by adding our back, nitrifying bacteria, you're going to reduce that ammonia and nitrite. But the speed at, what that ha at which that happens, you people, I added the bottle yesterday. Do you have any surface area? No, it's a bare bottom tank. We talk about that. You, the bacteria need to attach to a surface or my pH is six. I'm trying to grow discus. Well, we've talked about why that doesn't work. So there's water chemistry reasons why the bacteria may not work, but we know which ones you need. Heterotrophs, that gets into advanced microbiology and diversity. There hasn't we're been- We're not going to talk about today. We're, we're, no, we're not. We're, we're, gonna, we're not, <laughs> but we're going to hint that, you know, all these mixes, you know, and, and so, you know, people that listen to me for a long time know me, know this is what I've been doing for 30 years, a long time. It is a long time. And as a, my, field especially is, is microbial ecology. What does that mean? It's not just looking at the microorganism or a microorganism or even microorganisms. It's looking at the whole environment of energy. How does energy come into the system, whether it's light, chemistry, you know, flowing downstream into a lake, offshore into the ocean, but you're looking at how energy flows and how that affects microorganisms and how the microorganisms give a feedback, affect that energy. And we don't know enough about aquariums, which you would think they're small, you know, but we don't. We don't know enough about aquariums to know the exact makeup that you need. Okay. And, and yet I know we, I know we need the bacteria that are in waste away because by doing, you know, skimming and UV and everything I've shown, we've killed them all. We, you know, in a good aquarium, we, we have these, are they the only ones you need? I won't say yes to that. You probably need others, but these are a good start. And if you're having issues, the chances are high that you don't have the right bacteria in there. And not every mix, in fact, very few mixes have the right bacteria because it takes time and patience and effort to develop these mixes. And, and, and even though I've been doing it for a long time, I don't have the, the complete answer. No one does. We have a good, what well, I'll say, we have a good start. And with more studies and more research, we'll get better. But just because you add a bottle from someone doesn't mean it's going to work. Unfortunately, as with every industry, there are companies out there where their PR department is way above their scientific capability. If I can say that gingerly. <laughs> Did that answer your question, Hillary? Yes, I think so. And I, I was going to say a minute ago, like, we've had people ask us for like microbial diversity conversations and podcasts and stuff. So, you know, maybe that's something for the future. That is something for the future. Um, I think though, with that, it would help if we had some type of drawing because, because microbial ecology and diversity I've, I've really got to figure out how to, how to do that if I don't have some props to show people. Yes. So I like visuals, so I yeah, we can wait for that. We'll yeah, wait for that. Visuals <laughs> help because it, it's, it, it's a great topic, but first let's understand a little bit about microorganisms before we jump into uh, diversity. But no, I'd love to talk about that. And we do those types of studies with the genomic work that we do and things like that. So we can put some meat on the bone, as they say. <laughs> like it. And your next, your second question. Oh no, you you answered the both of them. Okay, so, um, yeah. then so so thanks for listening and in, um, if you're uh, interested in this, you know, there's there's great topics and as I said earlier, 
And I wrote a three-part article in um, Coral Magazine, started last uh, fall and it may be January issue this year. If, if you're uh, looking at maybe I want to do science, I love the coral reef, I like to, you know, study, kind of like me, um, there is a ton of work that can be done in aquariums that can be published in the best journals on this, you know, my, on microbes in aquariums. And it, and it works just in the ocean too. It's, it's pretty cool. And a lot of the work done on nitrifying organisms, and that's how we treat sewage. That's how we treat wastewater streams. That's how you treat, you know, pig runoff. So it doesn't go into the lakes or rivers and pollutes that. That's all full of organics and all full of nitrogen that has to be treated because we, we don't want all this waste just going into our lakes and streams and rivers and ocean. Um, and microorganisms are key to that. And the answers are not known and the tools are available. So there's tons of research projects that can be done on this. It just um, takes an inquisitive mind. So plug for uh, more microbial research and researchers. Yes, absolutely. I was just talking to somebody before this podcast about how we need to do more research in the aquarium realm, just because there's like, it, it just even fish species alone, like there's so many species that we know about, but we know so little about everything that's out there. Like this field has a lot of potential. Yeah, yeah. And, there, and it's a lot of fun. Who doesn't like working with water and fish and bacteria and in the labs? And, you know, even for me, I did field work on Mono Lake up in, uh, you know, outside of Mammoth. So uh, there's plenty of opportunities. You just got to just got to jump. Exactly. Okay, everyone. So this was a, a uh, we, we didn't cover everything in Micro 101, but school isn't one class. So we're going to have to come back and do it again. I like that. Uh, if, if, and if you have any questions exactly. that we didn't answer. Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. No, that's all right. Go ahead. I was going to say, if you have any questions that we didn't touch on, or if you want Dr. Tim to expand on something that he did talk about, leave a comment, let us know, send us a message. Um, you know, we, we appreciate your feedback. Yes. And, and uh, numerous people at RAP that came up said they like the podcast. They like the Monday jokes. And that means a lot folks, because, you know, Hillary and I are sitting here staring at a microphone and recording this and uh, it's nice to know that people are listening and having questions and enjoy it because that's the whole purpose of this it's it's education and you can i think tell from both of us that we're pretty passionate about it it's a it's a great field to make a career um and it's it's fun so uh, we do appreciate all the nice comments from everyone and they're here to answer questions and lots of shows coming up we got aqua shellas we've got raps magna later on so please don't be yes. shy. Yes. So excited. And in, I think in like two weeks, we're probably going to be recording our next Q and a podcast. So if you have questions that are not specifically related to what we talked about today that are, I don't know, we do a lot of like tank cycling, troubleshooting questions and stuff. If you have those kind of questions, send a message. We'll get them on the list. Yeah, but I am not going to do your homework. So <laughs> please do your research. Yeah. All right, everyone. This is Dr. Tim and Hillary. Another session of Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time.